Sir Alex Ferguson is here. He retired as manager of Manchester United Football Club earlier this year. He won 13 Premiership League titles over his 26-year career, among many other trophies. The Washington Post has said, compared to John Madden or Vince Lombardi winning 13 Super Bowls during their careers. Of course, that didn't really happen, but you get the point. Ferguson's extraordinary success has seen his influence extend way beyond the soccer game that he loves so much. Harvard Business School devoted a case study to his leadership principles last year. Former British Prime Minister Tony Blair recalls calling him for advice about his cabinet. And The Economist magazine has called him Britain's Steve Jobs. Here's a look at his retirement speech at Old Trafford. Your job now is to stand by our new manager. I should say that's a new manager that you chose. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had all the qualities. Yeah, yeah, but man, you left him in a very tough place to be. I yeah. mean, because you're following you. Yeah. You know? Some would say that you don't want to follow the guy who follows Alex Ferguson. You want to follow the guy who follows Alex Ferguson. Yeah. You know. Uh, I want to talk about this, but let's just begin because we're sitting here uh, at this point before an American television audience. Uh, Manchester United. Tell me about Manchester United. Well, I think it's a, such a romantic club. I think that dates back, obviously, to the, the 1958 Munich Air disaster. It yeah. created a lot of um, uh, sympathy, which it was justified because it was a young team growing. It could have been a great team, and all the players, I think the average age was about 21 years of age, mm. and eight of them lost their life in, in Belgrade in, in Munich in that air disaster. Um, but that uh, was only the start of the story. I think the real story uh, was when Sir Matt built a, a fresh team to win the European Cup within 10 years. And I think that created what Manchester United is today. It's got bigger, it's bigger and bigger. My first trip out to the, uh, Taiwan in 1988, thousands outside the hotel, running about in the corridors, knocking on doors. And that, that love of the club has just grown and grown. What accent do I detect in your voice? I'm um, a Glaswegian. <laughs> and you have a, a proud, bit of, you have a bit of Scots in you yes, also. Yes, I do. I do indeed. <laughs> uh, I don't say it as well as you do, though. No, no. Yeah. I've never changed my accent. I don't think... Um, uh, it uh, wouldn't uh, be your nature, no, would it? No, exactly. It wouldn't be your nature. Stay the way you are. Here's one thing you said. For a player and for any human being, there's nothing better than hearing, well done. Those are the two best words ever invented in sports. You don't need to use superlatives. Absolutely. Well done. Doesn't eh, well done? Yeah. But I think that um, I think there's always a that area where people get carried away and use superlatives. Oh, fantastic, wonderful! I just minimise it to well done. I think the, the mm. players get to know that that phrase and they know I'm satisfied and they know I'm praising them to to any level they want to take it. Well done. It's a fantastic two words. Mm. When you arrived, I mean, you were, had been a player uh, and a manager. When you arrived there in 1986, yeah. mm -hmm. well, it was a club, obviously, that um, my, my main philosophy really was with young players and developing young players. And Manchester United at that time did not have a, a youth system what I, 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 we should expect. Mm -hmm. Going back to the 58, Matt Busby, Babes and all that. And I decided I must build a football club. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, then I had to work really hard at developing a youth system, which gave me a, a stream of players continually through year after mm -hmm. year and right up to present day, and it, it existed this very day. Yeah, but think about this. I mean, just recently, today, when we have to make sure, if you call it football, we call it soccer, just mm -hmm. for everybody, yeah. for the mm -hmm. sake of different references. We read every season of somebody going from one team to another. Yeah. Some team buying some player because they think that'll take them. Yeah. Well, there's all, the, the, the way that the, the game has changed in terms of television, satellite television, the money that's ploughed in by television, it gives uh, clubs that opportunity. Even middle league teams are now spending 20, 25 million in players. You know, at United, we, we, we do buy players. But yeah. we also have this great youth system yeah. where they produce their own players. But the best dynasties always have some capacity to create a dynasty is to create a system yep. that will constantly produce Correct. new players and a system that allows them to grow into yeah. their own. Yeah, absolutely. Time. 
time. It's the, the, the secret, and uh, of course, with young players, not just do you you can create uh, your teams for three and four, five, six years. You also create a great loyalty. Mm. They'll always remember the the manager who gave them the first chance. They'll always remember. They'll always appreciate that opportunity given. And yet, in United, we've given young players at 16 years of age first team games. Ryan Giggs made his debut at 16 years of age, and has never been lost and giving players with ability the opportunity to play at United. But did all the money sometimes um, cause you to say, it's not worth it for me uh, to create the unity of a team, you know, to, to have somebody uh, that makes as much money, or B, is caught up in all the stardom? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I'd, I've never worried about teams who spend whatever they want to spend. Yeah. At the moment, we're getting a lot of... Middle East uh, owners, we've got American right, owners, right. Russian and Russian owners, and it never bothers me one bit. All I concern myself is how we can min maintain our level of expectation, be competitive, be up the top part of the league. Don't win it every year, but we're always competing every year. And that only, uh, the only concern I've ever, I have is make sure we are there. And uh, you can do it different, it's different ways. We've spoken about young players, yes, and it's really important that part. But from time to time, we have spent big money and right. given me the player who can make a difference. Hmm. Who's the best player you ever saw? Well, I, we, I'm a, I'm a Pele fan from way back as a kid, and there was always <laughs> this great debate about Pele and Maradona. Right, right, right. right. Well, I was brought up in the so Pele. Pele for you. Yeah, Pele for me. But the present day, you've got to look at Messi and Ronaldo. They yeah. are unbelievable. The best players. today. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. The best have what in common? Well, you know, I think they've the courage. You know, I, I say this for all the... Courage. The, courage. The courage to take the ball all the time. The courage to make sure they're not going to be intimidated by their opponents. The courage to express themselves at all time. And I think the great players have got that. Yeah. Are they born with it? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah but imagine that... But you can acquire it, but... You can develop through coaching, but I don't know if you can develop the courage. I think that's courage. definitely... You either have courage or not yeah, I think to be have. there. Yeah, I know. think so. I mean, it's like the best basketball players want the ball in the last 15 seconds. Yeah. When we assess teams, we always say, right, who's the player who wants the ball all the time? Their opponents. Who's the one that wants to take the free kicks all the time? Who's the one that wants to dominate? And that's the one you concentrate That's the one you want. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a winner. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. This is what The Economist magazine said about you. Mr. Ferguson could reasonably be described as Britain's Steve Jobs given his unorthodox, <laughs> talent-obsessed, and sometimes bruising approach to making something beautiful. Did, and we'll talk about all those things, but did you think you were making something beautiful? I think that uh, the encouragement I got from the early part, uh, once uh, the club stood by me, the, the, the early days were difficult. Yeah, they, the people wanted you were fired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, one or two banners were up saying yeah. time up and things like that. But <laughs> saying, saying what? Time Time's up. up. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, you, at that period, I lost a little bit of confidence, but I didn't lose my determination. And I knew the things I was doing at youth level were correct. So the board, with Mark Ned was the chairman, and Bobby Charlton in particular, mm -hmm. stood by him because he knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, I then knew that we had something special in these young players. Beckham, Giggs, Scholes, the Nevilles, the Butts. And we, it, they all came into the first team round about the same time. Mm. So when people assess United of today, they maybe don't understand it. They, those boys were the spirit of the club. They mm. created a fantastic spirit of Manchester United as it is today. Mm. Here's, here, it brings me to the Harvard Business School. This is a Harvard Business Review. Um, you went up there and they developed a, a case study. Yeah. Now, what was the question? Generally, these things have a question. Was it... The, 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 main, um, the main central point of, of uh, the discussion was love and hate. Love and hate. Yeah. Do the players love me or do the players hate me? Was there a balance? And, of course, there was also, you know, m many different opinions of that. I took the central position, respect. Yeah. That's all I was looking for, respect, you know. So, so if someone said they'll either love you or respect you, you'd say respect every yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think w that's really Suppose important. they said love or fear. Would you yeah, say fear? Yeah. Fear, I think fear does come into in some respect in the sense of um, when I, you lose your temper, I, I didn't 
I don't hide behind a bushel in respect to the times I've lost my temper. But you know what I, the quality I had was when I lost my temper, I never ever brought it back again. The next day was another day for me. Yeah, right. You, you finished. In other words, you just popped off and then. So they understand you then. Didn't, you didn't hold grudges. Never. Never hold a grudge. It's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And then they understand what you are and who you are. And they can get support from that. Yeah. You're a fan of Doris Kern Goodwin, Doris Kearns Goodwin and her book Team of Rivals, yeah. which was about Lincoln yeah, choosing yeah. his rivals for his cabinet because yeah. he respected their talent plus he wanted. Mm. Wanted them where he, he could see them. Chase Stanton and yeah. Seward into his cabinet and knew where they were, you know. Yeah. Very clever. And of course I think that uh Lincoln at that time was faced the most uh, difficult period for a, a, a president in terms of the South and the North and, and and also which was very good at not making quick decisions. He thought it all through and allowed his cabinet to have their say and then decide thereafter. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's a great book. I mean, it's a fabulous book. Yeah. You see the movie Lincoln? Yep. Do you like that? And I, I didn't think it was a great movie, but I thought the, the central piece about the, the, the of the time yeah. The, the period had to deal with was fantastic. Yeah. The acting was unbelievable. It was, oh. and, but but understanding that he had to do everything he could, push, pull, yeah, yeah, you know, That's screen right. in order to get what he wanted emancipation. To get. Yeah, because that was the goal, and he understood the consequences. Yeah. So let's go all out for yeah. emancipation. And by, by the, the the situation at Antietam, where he was able to oh. uh, announce it after that, he, winning that uh, particular battle allowed him the, the, to be able to give the. Emancipation yeah. Proclamation out, you know, so it was an important time that, you know. You're a kind of student of the Civil War. Yeah, I love it. I think it's a great history. I mean, it's a young history. The funny thing about it is um, I bought a couple of books. I was in Chicago for a week holiday with my wife and I went to a bookstore and I bought these couple of books of interest without... I'm going back about 14, 15 years ago. And I was in London one time uh, doing a thing with Young Apprentices and Gordon Brown says, what are you reading at the moment? I says, I've started a couple of books in the Civil War. Yeah. He says, I'll send you some tapes. So he sent his a dozen tapes of um, the professor of Virgin Uni University, Gary Gallagher. Yes. And I was playing in my, my, my uh, car every yeah, morning, right, right. you know, right. going to work in that. And I got, excuse me, a bit fascinated by it, you know, and... It's a fantastic history. I mean, and you shaped. go to battlefield sites when you come yeah, to the yeah, US. Yeah, yeah, I've been to I've been down to Atlanta. Gettysburg went, or not? Yes, Gettysburg, Gettysburg. Gettysburg, Manassas. Right. Yeah, I've been there. Bull Run. Bull Run, yeah. The first battle was, there were two battles there, of course. But I went up to Princeton to meet uh, James McPherson. Oh, yes. The great historian of the, the Civil War, his great battle cry of freedom. It was terrific. It was really very, very engaging and very accommodative in terms of how he saw it and things like that. Yeah, but not World War Two, not World War One, not the War of eighteen twelve, not any of the great. For same you, extent. it's the Civil War that speaks to you yeah. as an object of. Well, I took it on and I grew into more interest and more interested, yeah. and and I went to a, to a, a gentleman's house down in the south, down in Atlanta, and he had his every every armament that was used in the Civil War. Yeah. And then he showed me his, his, the battle plans of Sherman. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. I was going to ask you about Sherman. Yeah. Burned Atlanta. Burned Atlanta. Maybe it finished the whole thing. Famously you know. saying war is hell. Yeah. You yeah. Know. yeah. And and destroyed all the rail yeah. tracks. And, and, and I think he may have said, I'm not sure, but the people who hate war the most are those who fight it. Yeah, of course. You know, and that's a fact, accept, you know. That Patton may have been an exception. <laughs> you remember, he said, "I love it." I love it. Or, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Or, can you love war? <laughs> yeah, but it's it. I think, I think, lost, so, I think, think he so. loved command. Is what he loved, probably. Yeah, yeah. Patton and I, the challenge of. I think that um, or Napoleon probably might have loved it too. I think when before you enter war for, for, into the army, you think it's a great. I mean, well, it's great to join the army. But when you get there, I think going to these combats, I think it's different. It changes you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, yeah. you you go in thinking, you this know, is great. Yeah, <laughs> and then you see, and see what war can do. Yeah, absolutely. And devastation. You, you, you know, the devastation. Your comrades killed and all. Yeah, enough, I mean. yeah. Uh, and that's where you develop the idea of the most important thing in your world. You're not fighting for country as much. You're fighting for your comrades. You're fighting yeah. for the people that yeah, you're yeah. next to. Next to, yeah. You know that you've mm -hmm. grown to be. You know, mm -hmm. Go through all the experience. Absolutely. So you go to Harvard Business School, and they want to do this case study and about all of this and, and the question of love versus hate. Uh, and you, you you come up with this thing called the the Ferguson formula 
A formula for leadership? A formula for what? Management? Well, I think I think leadership somewhere uh, comes along. There's no question about that. How you uh, control? A, a, well, everyone says a bunch of millionaires, you know. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, it's a fact you have to deal with nowadays. The, the money that's earned and through football is, is quite extraordinary, and um, you have to control that part. And I think that there's certain things I would I would. Um, uh, way to put across your parents to do not actually always to maybe make them better footballers, to make them better human beings. Develop mm. them as a character so that when they leave me, they could go anywhere. You know, and I think that is really a really important part. Sometimes it's like education. It's not always about teaching them what history or mathematics. It sometimes inspire them to be the best they possibly can be. And so I you're think, teaching them life. Absolutely. I think that is really important. And you also be developing the character you know that if you develop the right character, character, they won't let you down many times. So, you know, once they go in that football field, they're playing for all the things you've ever taught them. Mm -hmm. The winning mentality, the determination, how to handle defeat, is also just as important. And therefore, you, you develop a group of people that are you. You can see yourself in them. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's... I've tried to do that all so, the time. So every team member that plays for you, you look at him and see yourself? Not all of them, but I like to see myself in the ones. But if you don't, do you want... No, no, you just keep developing. You know, everyone's different, of course. They express yeah. themselves in different ways. they are different types of talents, of course. And some, I would never have the talent they had as when I was a player. Yeah. But I still had that determination to be successful and try my best. You and I talked about it. We had a meeting on Sunday evening and, and you, we were talking about the idea that often the best players don't make good coaches or good managers yeah, yeah. because they don't understand someone who doesn't have the same skill level. Yeah, yeah it's a fact that uh, I remember speaking to Bobby Chaldon about that and he uh, was a manager at Preston North End and he couldn't understand why the players couldn't understand him. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he gave up on it. I mean, he, yeah. he was honest enough to say, oh, this is not for me. It's a fact of life. I think that if you look at my career, and in a sense I always say this to anyone who wants to be a coach, prepare to be a coach. And I, at 24 years of age, when I left engineering to go full-time in football, I made sure I was not going back to engineering. So I did all the coaching schools. I prepared to stay in the game. And I gave myself a chance by that, you know. And I was an average, a good to average player. Could score a goal, that type of thing. But I wasn't a Bobby Charlton or a, a Messi or an Aldo, obviously. Um, and there's very few really, really great players who have become great coaches. I think you can look at Beckenbauer, of course. Right. He won the World Cup with Germany as coach. Cruyff, um, who was a great player and won many trophies with Barcelona. Uh, other than that, I can't think of the really great players who maybe don't want to be a coach. Would it have been for you impossible to manage anywhere else? You couldn't go somewhere else, no matter how much money they offered you, no matter what the opportunity. Or you might have for the right circumstances to prove to yourself that you could do it again. Somewhere else. There was one or two offers came along in my time at United. Um, but I always, always come back to this point. Why would you leave United? Where is the bigger challenge? Yeah. And the thing about challenge is this. Once you've won something, you can't live in that. Yeah. No, not Manchester United. You've got to win the next one. And that's a challenge. Yeah. Creating that, maintaining that consistency of winning, which is a, a mentality that, you know, I've had. Once a, you know, every time we win the week, celebrate the night, next day is another day for me. Where are we going forward? Yeah. And uh, so, therefore, when if when clubs came to me and offered me jobs, I thought to myself, well, where is the bigger challenge? Creating history at United or trying to create somewhere else where I have to start again and build on all the, the philosophies I had when I first came to United? So stay at United. Stay at United. Uh, let me talk about these principles that are in this article and and what's called the Freeman the Ferguson formula. First one, start with the foundation. What does that mean? Well, this, the foundation is starting with um, what you, you, you believe in. I believe in building a football club rather than a football team. I can understand coaches who concentrate on the football team because it keeps them in a job. You know, yeah. there's, it's a result industry. You always look at the power of the canyon last week. 
five games or five six games into his first mm. his season at, at Sunderland, they allow him to spend nineteen million pound and then sack him. You know, to me, it doesn't. There's no evidence that's going to bring success. Yeah. There's no evidence. So by building the football club, I wasn't interested in losing my job because of my results of the first team. I knew I had to do a job in terms of building this football club. So uh, we worked really hard uh, with the youth system, making sure we had a solid foundation that would hold its fort for years and years. Mm. So when you see a Manchester United team, and the, the, we got to a position where I could plan ahead. So I could see three years ahead where this team was going knowing that I had certain players coming through the youth system would support the new teams all the time. And could step into the role that you had yeah. defined for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, the second point you say is dare to rebuild your team, which is what... Now, when you mean by that, you, you, even though they may have, a team might have another great season ahead of them, yeah. if, in fact, you know uh, that to have a good team the next year and the next year and the next year, you've got to rebuild, even at the sacrifice... Mm -hmm. of, of, say, winning? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the horrible part of the job, really, is um, when you have players who have been with you for years and the ev evidence is always in the football field, you know? And my job the is The evidence to, is always on the field. So when you see a player and then you see that the level just start to dip, mm -hmm. there's no point in waiting another two years, you know? You hurt him oh. more than you hurt yourself because he'll yeah. not want to recognise that the day has come where he's had his time, you know? And having to, to say that to a player and make the change is very, very difficult. But you can only do that if you have the system where it can fill the gaps mm -hmm. and then build, rebuild the teams as you go along. And mm -hmm. over the years, we probably built maybe five teams, you know, through the, the consistency of being there as a manager and the continue, continuity of the, the youth system and the players that you have are not going to last. Even the ones we buy are not just going to last for two, three years. You want them to be lasting six, seven, eight years. So buying a good age level, maybe 23, 24, is good ages. They've had experience maybe somewhere else, but they've got plenty of years left in them. So you can build a continuity of team. But what's important here is that you've got to, have, you've got to be ruled by your head and not your heart. Oh, absolutely. You have to say to, oh, you know, absolutely. I see it and it's going to, you know, better go now. It's a hard part. Even though that person may have helped take you to the best yes. moments of your life. Absolutely. You rode to, on his shoulders. Absolutely. It's a horrible part, as oh, I said. Foot. You treat them with family, you know, and, and then when you, because it's your family, it becomes even more uh, hurting in the sense that uh, you've got to say, well, Son, I'm sorry, you know, that you know you won't be regular, but you can get a career elsewhere, you know, mm. a different level. And that's happened a few times, but it's not an easy, th an, an easy situation. It's not an easy conversation. With. No, 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 it's not. Yeah. Then you say you've got to set high standards and hold everyone to them. Absolutely. Every. Every training session, intensity, expectation, the level of concentration uh, will always manifest itself on a Saturday. You know, and that's what we look for at United and... And we never had bad. We, I never in, uh, envisaged having a bad se session in terms of their training. We always made sure the players were completely concentrated and yeah. the, on the training first. sessions had had purpose. Absolutely, you, know, you knew exactly what they were going to be doing yeah. in order to get ready for Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The other one is that never. <laughs> I mm. believe in this one too. Never ever cede control, ever. No, no. You got to be in control. Yeah. Well, the point I'm making about you're dealing with very young and, and, and rich young men. Yeah. Um, and I, I always say to the directors, the minute uh, a player is, becomes more powerful than the manager... More what? More powerful than the yeah. manager of Manchester United. It's not Manchester United. Yeah. You've lost control of the whole club. So I always made sure I was in control because they knew who the manager was. They always knew who the manager Your was. Your word was law. Yeah. If you want to put it as, as blunt as that, yes. But it, you don't necessarily need to use power in that situation. The, the yeah. control is just nice. That they know who the manager is. They know I'm going to make the decisions. They know they can trust me, which is really important. Trust, and they know that I've, I've got the ability to adapt to change, and they've seen that many times over the years. And, and I think these are, are important parts of being in control of, of, of footballers. And what does this mean? Match the message to the moment. The... The moment, um, 
that we look for is is um, the result industry that they, they're aware that that this game, every game, is about winning. You know, and we try to get the message across. This is a moment where we have to win every game. The expectation is is we. My high expectation expectation of you is to win this match. But to come back, you know, to be able to say and to find within yourself. It's, uh, when that's, you're that far, you're that close to defeat. Yeah. You know, and someone has said, you know, it's a bit like the hangman's noose. Yeah. Nothing <laughs> well, concentrates the attention like... There must be a of, moment where they, they realised that, yeah, what's in their character has to be... Character. ...come through here. Yeah. We have to have the character to overcome this. I mean, we've, we've had some great, great moments of being behind at half-time and winning games late in the you game. You liked that, didn't you? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm a bit of a gambler that way because I always say to my half-time, be patient. Yeah. The last 15 minutes, throw the kitchen sink yeah. because it's worth it's worth the gamble. You're going to lose the game anyway. Yeah. And there's nothing better. You, you get in that last 15 minutes and actually win the game and the fans are going out the ground singing yeah. over the heart out. The dressing room is a fantastic place to be. So, yeah, hmm. that's comebacks are wonderful. OK, prepare to win is obvious. You've talked about that. Rely on the power of observation. Yeah. Well, it's an important part that people don't recognise, actually, by using your eyes. And I remember when it uh, first, first dawned on me that I had a young coach at Aberdeen who said to me, why am I here? Yeah. And I says, well, what, what are you talking about? He says, well, I do nothing. You do everything. He said, you shouldn't be doing all the training sessions. You should be in control of the training sessions. And let me go on with it. And I said, oh, no, wait a minute. No, no, I'm not for that. He said, well, I think you're wrong. And we had an old uh, trainer there at the time, Teddy Scott, he was a great old man. He says, boss, he's right. He's dead right. So I said, let me think about it. So we gave it a try, and it worked. And amazing what you're actually watching and seeing the players' habits, mm -hmm. even seeing the little defects in the performance and the habits, and you could see sometimes that he was not quite right today. I wonder what's wrong with him, you know, and it mm -hmm. could be a million things. And that observation I've carried through all my career, and I've used that all really well, mm -hmm. You know, you really have. you have to. I have a theory that you, you really do have to make sure that you're in the moment, you know, because if you're only in the moment, can you see with great focus? And you always yeah. have to ask yourself, yeah. what is happening here? Yeah. What is going on? Yeah. Well, that, you, yeah that's the power of observation. Yeah, exactly. Right. Absolutely. That's a power of observation. You, you don't take your eyes off and you, yeah. you, you, by doing that all the time, you, you increase your ability yeah. to see things happening. Yeah. You know? And people sometimes say things that's not quite where they, they, what they're saying. You've got to listen so carefully, you know what they're really saying, even though they're not using those words mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course, yeah. 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 And then there's never stopped adapting. You constantly have always, to change. Always. Um, I mean, if you look at United today, their training ground, Charlie, is fantastic. Yeah. There's only one thing they don't do in United training ground is do operations. Yeah. They've got MRI scans, CAT scans, right. they can do dentistry, dentistry, they can do the podiatrician, yeah. they can do all sorts of things. And um, that was one of the things that I, I really um, bought and embraced um, through our chief executive, David Gill. I said, you know, that what you want to make sure of this club, David, is that when a player is here, he sees the best facilities and we're always adapting and improving. Yeah. Yeah. Sports science, for instance, uh, about 10 years ago, a doctor came to me and says, you know, I think we really should be thinking about sports science. Yeah. I says, well, tell me. He says, well, there's two or three clubs that start to use it, and we really have to be ahead of the time. So he was dead right, but I wouldn't made it difficult for him yeah. by making sure he was convincing me. Yeah. I do that all the time, but it's just a game I play with them. In other words, you make them convince you so yeah, that you exactly. know they yeah. And then we, we got this sports scientist, and he then built his team around young men, great ideas, ideas jumped out of their head, great energy. And it's, it's taking United up again, you know? And I always mm. say that to adapt, you only adapt if you're going to be even for 1% improvement of progress. And it's always the way to look at it. And every year we're at United adapting to different things all the time. You know, mm. it's, it's quite amazing. Let me talk about some of the great players. You, Ryan uh, Giggs, you've mentioned. Oh, yes, wonderful. At 13 years of age, we, 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 he was actually training in Manchester City when mm -hmm. I went to his house. And it got to a level. Oh, yeah, yeah you, know, you, you and I talked about this the other night. 
uh, this happens in sports in terms of basketball coaches recruiting these young kids because they go there very early when they're 13 and early. Yeah. And you said to me, you got to get to their mother. Their mother. <laughs> so we got to a level where my assistant, Ms. Archie Knox, and myself were going up every second night to his house. And it got to a level when Ryan's mother says, will you be back on Thursday? <laughs> She was she was buy, she was buying in tea for us to give us supper, and you, you were becoming the best friend of the family. Yeah, absolutely, the mother's a secret. Mother was always the, the strong character in the, 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 the yeah. family, without question. And we say to all the scouts, get the mother, <laughs> get the always. mother, you'll get them. Yeah, yeah, uh, because the mothers have they and they want what's best. Sometimes they want the best coach because they think that that coach. Or that manager will bring their best their their son's talent out yeah. or daughter. There's always a danger with the father that he tries to live his life through the, ah, the boy. You know, yeah. yeah, you get a little bit of that. Not yeah. all of them, but you do. You have, I've seen the evidence of that, yeah. and therefore the mother's no, she's not down that line. <laughs> she's well, my boy. I want my best for my boy. So uh, Gary Neville, oh, fantastic character. Carries um, wakes up every morning at, at six o'clock, reads every newspaper. He wants to know what's going on in the world, and he's got a moan about everything, you know? <laughs> but he's such a successful person. He's now doing this television work. He's very good. He's yeah. very good. He's also doing very well in business. I wanted to bring on my staff, but he, 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 he yeah. didn't do, want to do that. He's now with English FA. He's got many, many hats now. Yeah. But um, a very, very determined character. And then there was a fellow named David Beckham. David, yeah. Uh, amazing boy, yeah. I mean, what is how he's created himself? He's an icon for young people. He's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he's a wonderful. Now, model. How did he do that? Well, he always a lovely smile, you know, yeah. and he, he's always presents himself well. But as a young kid, when I got him at twelve years of age, his great desire was to be the best footballer. He was a fantastic trainer. Practiced all the time. At night time, he'd come back with the schoolboys and practice with them. And uh, he, he was in that collection along with Giggs and Scholes and Nevilles. And then, of course, his life changed when he, he married the, the girl from... Spice. Uh, Spice, yeah. And, uh, and his focus changed. What did it become? Well, he got drawn into the, that celebrity status, you know. Yeah. And for me, I'm a football man. <laughs> I'm a football man. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't my... So you had to go to David and say... Yeah, he was to focus, and so there we tried So what did you do? I mean, did you go... Tell me what you said to him when you be believed that he was becoming more interested in yeah, I th celebrity I th I than football. Over, I just think it was over his head. I don't think he could listen. I always remember in the, in the coaching, he says, I'm in love, and well, there's nothing you can do about that, you know, and <laughs> and therefore he um, was to focus, I and mean, we sold him in Real Madrid. Yeah. He did well. The thing I couldn't believe... They go to LA Galaxy. Yeah. I couldn't believe that. I couldn't understand that. I would never have allowed, allowed them to do that, you know. Yeah. If I was going to let them go, I was make sure to go to the best, and Real Madrid yeah. are the best outside United. And But he's reinvented himself. He goes and plays for the English international team yeah. after a couple of years. He goes and plays for AC Milan in a European tie. Then last year, he plays for PSG in the quarterfinal European Cup. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it really is. And good. well done to him. I mean, he's... You can't yeah. argue with the status he has in life. Yeah, now. but would it have been better if he stayed at Manchester United and, and still for had me, all the celebrities? For me, it would have pleased me more yeah. to see him being a great, great player, you know. Uh, as I say, I'm a football man. But how can I argue with his life? You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's an icon for young people. He's, he represents himself the proper way. And, uh, and, and I say, well done. Yeah. Now, was he one of those guys, you have said you look for guys who are bad losers. Oh, David, uh, definitely. He was a bad loser. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Grumpy. Oh, yeah. Grumpy. The bad losers are all grumpy. Yeah, they're they're right. happy. Oh, yeah. The dressing room is not a very happy place. Those are the ones you want, though, because yeah, absolutely. they're driven not yeah. to be unhappy. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Winning is the name of the game. Yeah. You know, they don't forget that. And again, are you born with that, or is that something you acquire, you think? Is that in your DNA? Um, I think it must come from part of your family somewhere along the line. There's some people way back and show their winning mentality in a different mm -hmm. way, but some are very emotional about it and demonstrative about it. And David was very demonstrative as, as a young lad and loved winning. Uh, but um, I think it must come from somewhere in the genes. You've given advice to Tony Blair, even about some, you know, about strategic and how to handle people. Yes? 
Yeah, I've, I've I used to have some nice meetings with Tony down in number ten. Yeah, I thought I always think of Tony being the best at Question Time. I loved him in Question Time. Yeah, he destroyed those boys across the, <laughs> the path there. You know, he, he was fantastic. You like the competition? I love to see him in that. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we we spoke about many things. The one thing I always said to him about the the election time about canvassing: Why don't you take a physiotherapist with you? But the other thing that's interesting me about you is that you know is that the sense of mission, you know how to infuse the sense of mission, and you know how to, so that everybody knows they're playing for themselves, they're playing for their person to their right and their left, and they're playing for something larger than themselves. The team, the team ethic. The team ethic. Look around the dressing room. Look at each team member who've got beside you and trust them. Yeah. And that's the, eth- eth- uh, uh, the essence of a team, that they can understand the qualities and the failures, uh, the, yeah. the weaknesses yeah. of their teammates. And, and understand work. accountability too. Yes, absolutely. So if you look at a game of football, I always think you need maybe eight to win the game. Yeah. Three kind of a, an off day or a semi-off day, but they yeah. always work hard. And the players recognise that. And they'll do that little bit extra to make sure they get winning. Yeah. And the next week it may change round, of course. But that's it. The essence of, of the team is to understand and trust each other. And to trust me. To trust you. Yeah, absolutely. In other words, trust your plan. Trust, trust your yeah. strategy. Yeah, trust absolutely. your... My team selection. Yeah, team selection. Which is always difficult because I have to maybe leave five, six players out each week. Yeah. And I always bring them in individually to explain to them why they're not playing. Uh, and it's not easy because they all want to play. Uh, but next week they may, they may so be So what would you team. say to them? Give me a speech. I say to them, I could be wrong. But I'm picking a team. I could for be them. wrong. Yeah. I always say that. I could be wrong, but I think it's the right team for this game. And on other occasions, I may be picking a team for two or three weeks ahead. So maybe leaving out an older player for that occasion. And I would say, look, just get ready, yourself ready for three weeks from now. You'll be playing in that game. Uh, so therefore, you're giving them a boost, but and something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. Not playing tonight, but I'll be playing mm-hmm. three weeks from now. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, because I've been manager there a long time, I was able to plan that way, you know, and and also have the confidence to make changes for yeah. three, four games ahead. Yeah. Now, what about this? I think this was in 1999 when you won all three major competitions, which is unheard of, and up until the last minute of the European Cup final. Uh, it looked to everyone like you were not going to lose, win, you were, were going to lose. And your assistant manager at the time has said that your belief, your belief never wavered. No. Even though it looked like you were going to lose, you yeah. didn't think so. No, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't, scoring the two goals in injury time was not an accident. That was the character of the team. Too many times we'd done it that season, coming back from a goal down to win matches. Yeah. So it wasn't an accident. But you have to say a little bit fate. You know, a little bit of luck. Yeah. You know, it happens. You don't know how where it happens, how it happens. It happens. Yeah. And we got that little break on the first goal, and you could tell that Bayern were finished by that time. Mm. And it was the second goal was inevitable. Mm. When the Glazer family bought it, what 1995 was it? Yeah. What did it change? It changed nothing, Charlie. Nothing. You no, know, not a thing. That obviously, when a new owner, see the the thing, the the misconception about. The Glazers buying the, 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 the club and it created a, a sort of hostility with different factions of Manchester United supporters uh, because someone, a, a single member, was only in the club. They forget the minute they became a PLC, someone was going to buy it. Somewhere yeah. along yeah. the line, someone yeah. was going to buy that club. The Glazers did that, and, um, and in my time with them, they did nothing but support. Very strong single-minded people, uh, but always supportive of the manager and the things that are happening in the club. They've been very good, and I've, I've absolutely no hesitation in supporting the way they've gone about their job. Mm. Very low-key, very seldom, never give me a phone call. Mm-hmm. They'll phone the chief executive maybe once a week to go over the various things about the club, yeah. but never the team. Didn't so, buy it to run it, they bought it... Hmm. To yeah. see it be what it all could yeah. be. Yeah, let it be. Yeah, when you think about the, lo- the the record, the career, the wins, the losses, 
Uh, do you, what do you remember? Do you remember the losses or the wins? That's a good one. I can tell you about the bad losses we had. <laughs> I mean, losing 6 1 to City and 5 1 to City is games you never forget. But I remember we lost the City game and I came home and I put my head under the pillow. <laughs> I was, um, and my wife had been under out. the pillow. Oh, absolutely. I was, I was going nowhere. And my wife came in and says, What's wrong with you? I says, We lost 5 1. She said, no, no, you couldn't have lost 5-1. You know, it was, it was a bad one, you know. There is also, th th your wife you, is wonderful, and you told me a story the other night about when they... <laughs> when, the statue. When the statue. <laughs> they, so they, they're putting a statue up of you, and they've got it under a hood, right? <laughs> and she comes to you and says, well, or you said to her, uh, who do you think should... Yeah. Be here for the presentation. Yeah. She maybe, says, the, maybe Prince William. Yeah, so he says, <laughs> Prince, maybe Prince William. I said, no. Nah. no. She's, but he, he's president of the FA. It could be him. Yeah. And I'm, I'm st standing there, and David Gill announces my wife. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I said, how did he manage to do that? Because she, you know, she, she never go, told you. No, she doesn't go to the games either. Yeah. Oh, she never would go to the games. No, no. So she'd been in a few cup finals. Yeah. Why but, would she not come? Just. Well, I don't think she finds it comfortable. Yes. You know, I don't think she, she's, not, she's not a football animal. So she's getting ready to, to jerk the cover yeah, off. Yeah. And she says, she does it rather gently. Yeah. She fairly, she's afraid she's to get decapitate you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. The head comes rolling down. Yeah. But no, she's, it was amazing. I think it was the absolute correct person to do it. Yeah. You know, it was really. So what did she mean to you? Well, if. With my 47, she brought up the kids, I don't doubt about that. When she I was? She brought up the kids, the, you know, the children, she brought them up. Oh, she brought up the kids. Yeah, yeah, because you go back to my early days and at 32 years of age I went into football and I had two public houses in Glasgow. So I was running two bars in Glasgow and part-time at football. Yeah. You know, she, meanwhile, Cathy's got to get them dressed to go to school, doing the homework <laughs> with them, put them to bed, yeah. and I'm out all the time. You know, so yeah. that role was fantastic. I mean, there's no question. And they always remember she used to say to me, "Yeah, when they get to 16, they'll be daddy's boys." <laughs> I said, "Why do you make that? You can't." Make it. You wait. It. And, uh, and she was right. She was right. <laughs> they're always right. Even they're wrong, they're always right. <laughs> Even if they don't like the conclusion, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're right. But yeah. you know, the thought of seeing it seven years of marriage is always in the support yeah. system and always be able to tell you the truth, you know? Yeah. When, you, when she says, you're, you know, you're wrong. You she know? would tell you. They're good at that. Oh, she yeah. would tell you. Absolutely. Never. Absolutely. She's yeah. good at that. Okay. But uh, there are two things that, that remind me of you and interesting. What happened to you and Wayne Rooney? Well, I don't think anything really happened. That, really? That, um, really? I would get upset about. Um, he came in the day after when the league is common knowledge, he asked away, and it's this expectation thing again. I, I'm not his PRO. Yeah. I manage a team for what I've seen the pitch, and he, he, at that particular moment, he wasn't doing particularly well. Yeah. But now we see him today... He's got his energy back, he's got his purpose back, and he's doing great. So maybe that was a good turning point for the boy, you know? Yeah. But he but, thought it, but didn't you think of him as a son, in a way? Well, he, he came as a 70-year-old yeah. boy, and of course, yeah. all the young players, we support them and look after yeah. them and do our best to make them better. Um, and it, it, was a, it was some great moments. But of, did it end badly? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think if Wayne walked in here today, he would, he would shake my hand. I, I don't think... When was I, the last time you shook his hand? Um, the day we won the league, you know, when we were presented with the cup, uh, oh. rather, sorry. Um, you see, you've got to also look at the media. W Wayne's unfortunate in this sense that he's England's big white hope. Yeah. You know, internationally, he's a big white hope. So, therefore, the media is always centred around Wayne. And he has people who advise him, and I think that's where all that's coming from. I never fell out of him at any time. You know, sometimes they would discipline them. You know, sometimes they all need discipline, but not to the extent that you would think there was some sort of a. How would you discipline them? Well, if if they've stepped out of line, you maybe fine them a week's wages. Oh yeah, uh, okay, but, or not let them put not put them in the lineup. No, no, I wouldn't do that. You no, never do no, that because no. well, that would hurt you. Yeah, but no, he's 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 backed his form, and if that's in some way I've I've helped to bring that back, then I've done the right thing. Yeah. Make him aware that he's a great player. Yeah, but well, you we weren't thinking it. about you weren't thinking about what I'm doing for him. Where you were thinking about it, it just doesn't work. Uh, it's for the team. Yeah, good you for know. the team. Yeah, yeah, 
Absolutely. And, and, but it so happened that it became good for him. I think so. Because he had to bring it together yeah. to be what when he the, could be. When the club, and the, the club did very well, refused him to sell him to Chelsea, he realized his only job was Manchester United. And he's brought back his focus, he's brought back his work ethic, and his purpose, and he's, he's, well, he's, doing, he's playing well again. What do you think of Roman Abramovich, speaking of Chelsea? It's a strange one, Chelsea, you know, that they, they, they change the managers so many times. And, yeah, they've won the European Cup. They won three league titles in, yeah. in Abramovich's time. They've won the FA Cup three times in Abramovich's time. Yeah, they keep changing the coach, you know. I, that works for them. That works for them in terms of keep winning. But you you look at the long-term uh, situation, you would worry about that. Um, they have been, well, in the last few years, they've been our main competitor. Mm. So it's it's uh, it's a very competitive uh, situation between. Suppose and he came to you. Maybe he has. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, he used an agent when he first came to approach me, and I yeah. said, no, no, no chance. You couldn't do that. No yeah. chance. You didn't even want to have the conversation. No. You didn't want to see what no. they would offer. No. You just said no, no. Chance. no chance. I could never be that way yeah, no, for no. the team that was a rival of where yeah. I. Made my home. No, no. Manchester United is my team, my club. So anybody who speculates that you may be back in football in any way is simply wrong. There's a job coming up there. Was a notice of the odds are eighty to one, Ferguson. Good odds that. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd be wasting your money. <laughs> you'd be throwing your money down the drain. <laughs> no, no, no way. No, no way made, Ferguson is back in football. I made my decision, Charlie. It was timing was perfect. I went out a winner. There is no way back. I look forward to the challenges of my new life and doing the things I, I've been waiting maybe 35 yeah. years to do. Yeah. You know, I want to go to the Kentucky Derby. I want to go to the Masters. <laughs> I want to go to the Melbourne Cup, but don't tell Cathy that. <laughs> I'm trying to find a way of tunneling through the ground. She doesn't notice. But uh, and there's a lot of things I want to do. I want to go to the vineyards in Tuscany and, yeah. and France. And, oh, yeah. You, know, you did I, that? I, no, I've, I've done France oh, a couple of times, yeah. but I'd love to go to Tuscany. So these yeah. beautiful Antinori wines, you know. Yeah. So the, you you're now having a very good time. Yes, I'm you're enjoying learning, it. You're learning, seeing. You can go to a battlefield. You can go to the Masters. Yeah. You can go to sorry. Kentucky Derby. Correct. You can go to what else is on the list? It's, do you have a bucket list? You know what a bucket list is? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, movie. Yeah, all yeah, right. right. Yeah, it was that's a great right. movie with yeah. De Niro and Port Morgan Freeman. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but, no, no, no. Jack, Jack Nicholson. Nicholson right, yeah. right. But you know that. Well, I've mentioned the, the Kentucky Derby and I mentioned the Masters and the Melbourne Cup and doing France and there's a lot of things that are coming up now in terms of doing leadership speeches. A lot of people want me to do these things and these are challenges which I see is because once I made my mind up to leave United, I was never going to think that I've, I've made a wrong, a wrong decision. Mm -hmm. I was just looking forward. I'm not interested in managing. I'm not interested in, in Get myself worked up about United results. They're in good hands. David Moyes will do a good job. Yeah. Um, oh, you, you're still behind him. Absolutely, 100. percent And all the club will be. Yeah. You know, it's a great thing about the club. Uh, they'll support the manager. And he'll, he'll be fine. He'll be good. All right. Now, here's my scenario. So let's say Roman Abramovich has got a lot of money. You know that. Mm. He's got more money than God. Right. Yeah, exactly. Abramovich. That's a good one. Uh. <laughs> uh, you, you love horses. Yeah. Love horses. Yeah. I mean, say to you, look, come manage Chelsea. I will give you the greatest stable of horses you've ever seen. You ever seen? <laughs> it's a temptation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you always, everyone dreams of. You have it. to know a man's weakness. You know what I mean? I know. You always dream of having the Derby winner. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have a share in the horse who was a favourite for the Derby this year. Yeah, I got injured. Yeah, telescope. Good horse. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's injured at the moment, but it'll come back next year. It'll be a very, very good horse. Mm. But, um, no, you have, everyone dreams that we have again a, a Group 1 winner or a Derby winner or whatever, the ARC winner. But, uh, you know, as I said, I made my mind up. I'm looking forward to my new career and my new challenges. Yeah. Now, what's a new career? Well, I've got, I'm an ambassador of Royal United. I'm, oh, right. I'm the chairman of the, the, the manager's uh, committee in, in UEFA. Yeah. I'm an ambassador for UNICEF, which is great work that. Yeah, it's good work. And United have had a great association with them for the last 10 years or so. Uh, I've been down to South Africa and seen the, these um, uh, poverty of children yeah. also 
child prostitution in Thailand. I've seen all that. Yeah. And you know that the work at UNICEF, UNICEF do, they need support with that. They need, yeah. they need funding, of course. But you see what they're doing, you know it's really worthwhile stuff. And I've quite enjoyed doing that with them. And uh, it's a challenge. You know, it's a different type of challenge. Um, you're a big Labour Party man, aren't you? Yep. Yep. Never so- changed that either. <laughs> I wouldn't change it either. I've been, I've been um, tempted to get me into the, the Scottish National Party. Yeah, know? I know. Why don't you like Scot- oh, Scottish no, no. nationalism? I'm, no, I don't no, understand no. that. No, I mean, my friend Sean Connery is all oh, for yeah, it. Oh, yeah, Sean is very much. Yeah. I was with him What's summer. wrong with you? Well, he's from Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I was brought up in a socialist background. My father was a socialist. My mother was a socialist. Yeah. And, so uh, there you are, socialist. Yeah, why change? Yeah, right. Yeah. It's never, uh, it's never hurt me not changing throughout yeah. my life. Yeah, so I wouldn't change. And I think that, I think Britain United is is, is okay. Uh, and, but if Ed Miliband, you know, they're ahead in terms of the polls against the Tories. You know, if they have an election, they could maybe he wins, he might have a job for you, another oh, job. Oh no, it's one thing I wouldn't get into politics. Because, <laughs> you know, no, uh, that's a different way for me. Yeah. That you know, it's not my scene. Yeah. All right, let me close with this. Um, You've written your own biography. You did that about ten years ago, I think, yeah. was it? You know, you've got this new case study at Harvard, in which you talk about leadership. What's the best moment ever for you in football? Well, the best moment has to be Barcelona, of course. I mean, that was the, the trophy I never won. This is always a sort of an albatross around my neck. Yeah. And winning that particular night, and the way we did it was you can never forget it. But I think that. To encapsulate my life is to have 27 years at Manchester United as a feat, as an achievement. The continuity and, and uh, the, the consistency I created there and going out to the top, you know, I, I can't ask for anything more. That's, for me, uh, you know, I've, I've achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve and uh, I've gone out a happy man. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Charlie. You've been great. Sir Alex Ferguson. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.